on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored, with me, Richard Tice. And me, Isabel Oakeshott. Protesters clash with police as tensions over migrants turn violent. Is it toxic rhetoric to blame for stoking these tensions, or is it just the government's utter failure to grasp the extent of the crisis? Overstretched and underfunded dire warnings on the state of the British military will debate whether the armed forces can still defend Britain and assess the threat from China as the US shoots down another UFO. Plus, as teachers plan yet further strikes and schools battle a recruitment emergency, a lesson in how not to fix the mess. We'll hear from the teacher who was fired because he wouldn't use a student's chosen pronouns. Live from London, this is Here's Morgan Uncensored with Richard Tice and Isabel Oakeshott. Protests erupted outside a hotel housing migrants in Merseyside this weekend. On the one side, the so-called far right, many of whom are just unhappy that hotels are being taken over for migrants at vast taxpayers' expense. On the other, the far left, who like nothing more than a scrap with the people they label fascists. Many similar protests are taking place over the coming weeks. It feels like this is just the beginning. Demonstrations are planned in Rotherham, where 130 asylum seekers are housed at a hotel for an unlimited period of time. Now, the local MP, John Healy, that's Labour's John Healy, says the hotel is utterly unsuited to asylum seekers and that neighbours weren't consulted. Surprise, surprise, now there's trouble. Members of an unpleasant-sounding organisation called Yorkshire Rose will gather to make their feelings known, and they will be met by another organisation called Yorkshire Against Hate, which is rallying its troops for a counter-demo. One week later, both tribes are sharpening their spears for a hotel protest in Cornwall. Well, what could possibly go wrong? Quite a lot, if events in Merseyside are anything to go by. It all kicked off there on Friday night outside another hotel, housing asylum seekers. Naturally, the left-wing media blamed the disgraceful scenes outside the Suites Hotel on the, quote, far right. So it's probably only fair to mention that the Communist Party was also there in force. And yes, the Merseyside branch of the Communist, branch, uh, uh, the Communist Party urgently appealed for all anti-fascists to join them at the hotel, saying, drown fascism in a sea of resistance, was how they urged it. You see, it does take two to tango. And yes, this is the same Knowsley, by the way, where a couple of years ago, 30 Extinction Rebellion protesters were arrested in September 2020, some waving placards saying, refugees, welcome here. Do you see the link? See what it's all about? Maybe it's just worth pointing out that the UK is not the only place with this problem. Let's look at Dublin, hardly the beating heart of the far right itself. And Dublin has faced many similar protests for months and months now, involving plenty of decent, law-abiding people who are simply concerned about the impact of large groups of unknown young men of military age being transplanted into their local communities. These fears are not unreasonable. These fears are not illogical. They're not unfounded. I mean, just last week, for example, four asylum seekers, supposedly children aged 13 to 16, time will tell if that's true or not, were arrested for the alleged rape of a 15-year-old girl at a school in Kent. It's not fascist. It's not racist. It's not hateful to be worried about this sort of thing. It really isn't. What... What, what happens when you get another 50,000 migrants coming here over the course of this year? Hundreds more hotels needing to be requisitioned. The real question is actually not which side is the worse than the other, but why on earth are we in this shameful situation at all? And what are we going to do to fix it? Well, I'm delighted to be joined by immigration lawyer Harjip Singh Bangal, plus T Talk TV contributor Esther Kraku and political journalist Ava Santina. I mean, 
This situation is going from bad to worse. And Harjit, because we've just seen that it's not just the UK. We've, you know, we know it's happening in Dublin. We know it's happening in France. Um, many on the left are instantly saying it's just the far right, as though we've only got the far right here in the UK. It's nothing to do that. It's an utter failure of government policy. You're right. It's a total failure of the Home Office and the people in charge to get a grip on the situation and to realise how to deal with this and how to fix it. You're asking one of your questions is, how do we fix it? We don't need to house asylum seekers in hotels. We can let them work and pay their own rent. And they will pay their rent when their case is finished and decided. We take away that permission to work. Alongside that, however, we must process claims quickly. Oh. And must deal with them in 15 days, 20 days, like we used to before 2010, before this government came in. In 2010, and before that, in 2008, we used to send back 60,000 people a year. That's more than the 50,000 coming now. Last year, that went down to 3,000 people. And that's been slowly coming down over the years. So in 2015, we sent back 5,500 people. So it's been slowly coming down. So it's is, not something that's down overnight. Is that Home Office officials? Or is that a Conservative government instruction? Or what? I think it's a lack of political will, it's a lack of competence, it's a lack of trained staff. Lack of funding. Lack of funding. Yeah. Ava, I mean, come on, let's be honest. This wasn't far right. This was concerned local groups in a Labour stronghold. Knowsley's the safest Labour seat in the country. Maybe it's wrong to actually label the groups and say, look, actually, these people are genuinely concerned. Well, I think that's kind of a dangerous way to frame it because Knowlesley isn't really... It doesn't really have the values that the rest of Liverpool has. Actually, it has given birth to quite a, a big rise in the BNP over the last 20 or 30 years. It's, it doesn't represent the values that the rest of the city holds. I also But think... the facts don't match that. It's the safest Labour seat well, in the country. We I... also can't prove that any of those people who were there or, you know, the entirety of the people who were there Our were actually supporters. from the area or were Labour supporters. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, they could have come from anywhere. You had, you had, you had the communist Merseyside branch. Yes, come on. who were fighting against. I think, fighting I think, against I think you the accept, people. David, do you accept that the way this story has been framed by a lot of the left wing media, The Guardian in particular, but it's not the only one, is that this was a far right protest that spun out of control? They didn't mention the fact that there were quite a lot of extreme left people at that place as well. Do you accept that it took two sides? I don't know how I'm supposed to accept that when I don't know where the people were from and I don't know the motives behind it. I mean, I think the most obvious motive is that people turned up because there was an alleged assault that happened and people came to defend what they describe as English people against, you know, these asylum seekers, which right. is a really ugly way for it to turn out. And I'm sorry, but that is narrative that is intrinsically I, I think, linked to the I far think right. The thing is, I think the thing is, we have have to, we have to recognise that when you have an influx of people that are not, you know, native to this country, and that's not to say that the UK is not used to immigration. Of course, we're used to immigration. We're, we're a multi uh, sort of ethnic country. But when you have an influx of a certain group of people that are not native to a particular region, obviously there will be social tensions. I do think it's unhelpful to label the people there far right, just because, like you said, we don't know if they were far right, and we don't know if the other people there were far left or whatever. We don't. We haven't actually ascertained where they. Well, I, I tell you what, we have ascertained. But it what? is it is social tensions that has been caused by an influx of these people, which again comes down to government incompetence. Mm -hmm. Because if we knew that they were here legally, if we knew that they could work, they could pay their rent, that they weren't an alleged hotbed of all these kind of alleged assaults, then the, the social, the uh, sort of tensions, societal tensions would have decreased. But we don't know these things. Right. Let me, let me just pick up on the yeah. point that you made yeah. about allowing them to work, which I think is actually highly controversial. So I understand your point in the sense that if people are going to be stuck here for two years, it is patently ridiculous that they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs, Absolutely. no doubt finding other things to do. Expected the devil to makes survive on for... £40 a week. Right. Of course you're going to drive them clearly, to crime or you're going to ask them, or they're going to sit there idle. But, but is allowing them to work actually the solution to the problem? Them to... Because isn't that simply going to encourage more right. and more people to come over and won't there end up just being an amnesty for those people? What was a Parisio that I said? Allowing them to, them to work until their claim is refused or decided, which should be decided under a fast-track system. If they know our case is going to be decided in 15 days 
and we can only work for 15 days, and we're not going to be put up in hotels. They're we're not, not going to get government well. handouts. Well, I think yeah. at, that, yeah. at that point, right. I don't think... I completely agree with you that their cases should be fast-tracked. I think even Rishi Sunak yeah. has made this point, which is one of the few things... Well, I we used to have it yeah, under, exactly. under a Labour government. Exactly. No, and then the no Tories one... came in and decided in their wisdom but to scrap the fast-track. No one track. is arguing with the incompetence mm. of the government in handling this. I do agree with Isabel, though. I don't think they should be allowed to work, because I agree with you that cases should be, should be processed quickly. I think being able to work in this country is actually a privilege, and I think if you have yeah. so many people that aren't but able to get the jobs that they want... Well, come hand... over here and then take government handouts if you're not allowing but not people if we're who processing are processing them quickly. Refugees not if we're processing them quickly. Yeah, but that, isn't, a, that isn't happening. But, uh, but Ava, do you well, accept? That should happen. I yeah, do. Well, do, yeah, do you not accept not... that actually, if you allow people to work for months and months and months, possibly years, then it's going to act as an even bigger magnet and draw for more people to we come illegally when actually... A magnet. We, we, we call we, everything a magnet. And look, I, I, but, but, this but is not going to be news to you, Richard, because you know this. You know that most people who come over here, if they are in hotels for two years, they do work. They work cash in hand. So, you know... So is that OK, watch, then? I'm just saying it does happen because the Home Office takes so, so long to do? process what would you them. Do? If you I would were... do exactly what we're saying, what has been proposed, right. which is allow people to work while their claim has been processed. Yeah. And absolutely, how do, how do we track them? It's then? a huge topic for the UK. How are we tracking it's them one now? of our most. Pre it's well, they're so working now, got... they're working cash in hand. How do we track them being able to. Because they'll have an insurance number and their employer will pay tax. Do you know how long it takes yeah. to even process a passport? You've got no choice. Every asylum seeker. But neither of you are onto the point. If you allow people to You'll process the moment you come into the country. Why can't you be given have, a number you'll then. Have even more people coming every week, every month, because all of a sudden you can work here and the system will get even more well, swapped. Well, then the answer to that is carry on paying for them. Let the British people pay for them. We don't want that. You can't have British people putting up people in hotels. They've had enough of it. Can I, can so I what, just, let, can let I, the okay, asylum just, seekers okay, let them asylum seekers pay their own way, pay tax. If an employer is going to pay their no. wages and pay tax, then, then let them. But and actually, when, you've, and when you've given the right point, which is that actually. Ten years ago, when the Labour Party was in charge... More than ten years ago. More, just over ten years ago, yeah, 13 years ago, uh, actually, it was being done promptly and efficiently, yes. and tens of thousands were being denied uh, asylum, and therefore they didn't need to work. That's what we've got to get back to. But look, can I just focus on the next 12 months? Mm -hmm. I mean, already we've had 2,000 come across the Channel in the first five weeks of the year, in the depths of winter. This is going to be 40, 50, 60,000. It's another 400 hotels. Heaven knows where they come from. What's the mood going to be like up and down the towns of cities of this country, Ava, if that happens? What concerns me is that it's ripe for the next election because I think we're in a really toxic space at the moment where instead of actually focusing on some of the, you know, the cost of living crisis which is being caused by the Conservative Party, we are now blaming this on people who are trying to seek asylum. You are not going to be able to, in the next 12 months, curtail the number of boats who are crossing the Channel. France aren't on board. We're not willing to put up more money. It's not going to happen. The, uh, the only pressure that you could put on is onto the Home Office to process people's claims quicker. I think, I think, it, Sorry, Esther. I think one of the things to talk about in terms of how the, the public will take this is also the security element. So I know we, we don't often want to talk about Shamima Begum and the fact that she's been banished, but in reality, right, 150 ISIS fighters were able to come back to the UK. And in general, the public don't have a lot of faith in our internal security forces to keep our borders safe. Can you imagine what the mood will be like when 40 to 50,000 more migrants I mean, come into this country this year? I think it will move past just being kind of an influx of these people that are unknown. It will be a security issue because yeah. people are just saying, Saying, we don't know who these people are. Hard, hard job. We, we, unreasonable. 40, 50,000 won't matter if we're sending 60 back. We've got to get these people returned. Oh, I think have you that is not happening. Have you any confidence None at that all. this Home Office can sort this out in in a matter of six months, let alone one month? No, they haven't been managed to do it in the last 12 but years, also... and they will not be able to do it. And what's going to happen is you're going to have yeah. tensions build up. But the one thing is, whether you're far right or far left, you don't take a one-metre wrecking bar to a peaceful protest. You, <laughs> right. right, that's no. what was happening in yeah, the videos. Too. Right, so they, those people are looking for trouble. They... And, and they are creating tension. And to say that that was a peace, both sides are peaceful, then no. that's, that, we, that's not... You, you cannot take the wrecking bars. I mean, I think the far yeah, right, far left right, debate yeah. is just actually a bit of a red herring. Yeah. I mean, because, it, yes, it concentrates on what's happening on those particular protests, but it doesn't actually enlighten us any about the broader picture? Well, what we do know is that there are more demonstrations on both sides that are planned in the coming weeks. That'll be months. And as more and more people come, more hotels are occupied and indeed sort of requisitioned by the government. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this has got sort of terrifying...
potential yeah, I mean, consequences it's a powder, six, it's a nine powder months. Keg, it's isn't a powder it? keg. It's an absolute powder keg. And I have to say, I think the Tories utterly deserve to pay the price for it. Oh, it is absolutely. a complete disgrace they will. that we are in this I'm situation. Well, well, it's maybe, not a party I'm, political no, but It's I, just an absolute reality of I'm not sure Keir Starmer's got any likelihood to improve it equally. But he got um, more people deported under, under Labour. Under the previous Labour, you're right, Harjip. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely to see you, Harjip. Ava and Esther, we will see you a bit later in the show. Right. So, next tonight, NATO says that the military is overstretched as the Defence Secretary launches a security view over China's spy balloons. Can our armed forces really still defend Britain? We'll debate that next. and always straight to the point. World-class broadcaster Vanessa Feltz is on Talk TV every night of the week. From politics to pop culture, there's no subject she shies away from. And remember... If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Join Vanessa Feltz on Talk TV every day from 4pm. back and he's uncensored debating the breaking news and talking to the biggest names Piers Morgan is live every week with a host of stars uncompromising unmissable and uncensored and remember if you're thinking it we're talking about it Piers Morgan uncensored Monday to Thursday at 8 p.m. on talk TV Conversation. Oh no. Uh, with the People's Channel. No, it already is. Uh, every little helps. For God's sake, is nothing original anymore. It's finger licking good. I'm loving it. Look, let's be honest. We don't have any fancy speechwriters here, but we do. And I promise you, discuss the issues that matter to you. Yes, I'm back. Talk TV, not with Morgan, just before him. Monday to Thursday at 7 pm. Join me. Just do it. Well, that one too. And welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, apparently, the UK is no longer a top-level fighting force. That was the warning from one US general who said that the British Army is now a shadow of its former self. And with the war in Ukraine raging, unidentified flying objects popping up here, there and everywhere, are we sure that Britain can really still defend itself? We certainly don't have the boots on the ground, the troop numbers having halved since the Falklands War. And increasingly, we don't even have the infrastructure either. We've cut back on tanks, we've cut back on planes. We can't even apparently afford to replace them. Well, joining us now are security expert Dr Sally Leavesley 
and former Pentagon advisor on defence, Elbridge Colby, and former head of the British Army, Lord Dannett, to talk about this very serious uh, situation with the state of the armed forces. Uh, Lord Dannett, if I can come to you first, thank you very much for joining us. This situation with the state of the army in particular, uh, which has had quite a lot of uh, media debate over the last few days, um, I'm interested in how many uh, men and women you think would actually be at the ready to serve now uh, on the front line and, and the backup required if we had to go and defend ourselves. What, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, Isabel, I don't think numbers are really the issue. It's our equipment and our overall capability. I mean, there is no doubt that over the last 10, 15 years, there has been a significant underinvestment um, in our military overall, but in the army uh, in particular. So the criticisms that have come from, I think, a still anonymous American general and other criticisms have come are, are well placed. And I think the only encouraging aspect to this is that Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, really seems to get this and is arguing the case as much as he possibly can that particularly in the light of a vicious land war in Europe, we need to increase our overall defence spending and particularly increase our defence spending, our spending on our land forces, on our army. I mean, you say that the numbers aren't the issue, and of course they're not the only issue, um, but the, the debate has long raged in defence circles as to the extent to which mass matters. Isn't the situation in Ukraine an illustration that mass actually does count for something? I mean, clearly the UK wouldn't want to treat its personnel the way that President Putin treats the people that he conscripts into the armed forces there, uh, almost as if they count for nothing and are utterly dispensable. But in the end, if you run your army down uh, to only a few tens of thousands, you may well have a problem in a situation where mass is important. Well, again, you're absolutely right. But I think we have to bear in mind that the United Kingdom, as a member of NATO, um, plays an important part in the overall European security. And actually, it's the role that we play with our other NATO European partners and, of course, the United States and Europe that is so significant. But there is no getting away from... Well, actually, the size of the army is falling to about 75,000 at the present moment. Um, when I was the chief of the general staff, it was over 100,000, and we were fighting two campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. But again, it's not so much troop numbers that matter, although they do matter in some ways. It's actually to make sure that those people have got the right equipment. There's no doubt about the leadership, the training, the motivation of British soldiers, but you've got to give them the right equipment. For example, you asked about numbers. We're currently only planning to upgrade 148 of our Challenger 2 tanks to Challenger 3, the next generation of improvement, if you like, to that status. Well, we've got well over 200 tanks, so why are we not um, increasing from Challenger 2 to Challenger 3 well over 200 well, tanks? That, and, that, again, without being too specific... Without I, being I guess, too Richard, specific, that's why we need to up the budget. Infantry fight... Um, uh, I'd want to bring in uh, Elbridge uh, Colby. Of course. I mean, I, I won't... Um, yeah, yeah, Richard, of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I won't make too many examples. I could go on for quite too long, and I won't do that. But, but you're absolutely right that we've got to increase the budget. The, the defence budget is around about 2%, just over 2% of GDP at the present moment. Last year, Boris was talking about raising it to 2.5%. Liz Truss, briefly, was talking about raising it to 3%. And Jeremy Hunt, the very spendthrift chancellor, Previously, I, I was talking about 3%. Richard, well. I suspect so we've got to increase our defence spending. That is for sure. Well, um, let's bring in Elbridge Colby from Washington. Thanks for being with us. Um, let's discuss this extraordinary situation with the Chinese spy balloons, uh, these other objects. What is your verdict as to... Uh, is it really China uh, with, for all of these objects? And... What's, what is going on here? What is basically? going on here? This is a bit of a shock to everybody. It's a massive wake-up call. What are they trying to do? Well, there's a lot of questions in there. The first balloon mm -hmm. is is definitely a Chinese surveillance balloon, a massive balloon. It's the size of three three American football fields, apparently, the balloon, as well as uh, the, the actual thing it was carrying is 
a uh, couple size of a couple buses uh, in, in American parlance. So it was very significant. The other ones, apparently, we don't know yet. I was watching John Kirby this morning, the White House spokesman on national security issues, and he was saying they haven't even recovered much of it. Now, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the, I mean, technically unidentified flying objects have been brought down in some pretty we inhospitable places. Uh, in in Alaska and Canada's Yukon, Elbridge, and, we've got and we've got a clip of, uh, of of a U.S. general uh, with his own thoughts on this that I think we can uh, watch now. I haven't ruled out anything uh, at this point. We continue to assess uh, every threat or potential threat unknown that approaches North America uh, with an attempt to identify it. Wow. I mean, what do you think to that, Elbridge? Is this is this for real? Well, I think he's being careful. I think that if you were putting your prudent money down, the Chinese have initiated an enormous, uh, you know, world-spanning, and particularly U.S. and Asia, spanning South America, uh, balloon surveillance and other kinds of uh, sort of platforms that we not, may not know about. I think you're right, though, that this is a real wake-up call to the American people. And I think it's very important that British and European audiences really understand that China is felt to be across the political spectrum, increasingly the primary threat to Americans' interests. And that is going to have implications, including for our policy in Europe over time. Um, Elbridge, is it your instinct that all of these uh, unidentified objects have come, their origins are from Beijing? Uh, or do you, are you more open-minded than that? First question. And second question, I'm just a bit intrigued as to why it's taking so long to recover any of the debris. Of course, I, I understand that these objects were flying over, in many cases, frozen wasteland. That does seem a strange place to carry out a surveillance operation. Uh, but I wouldn't have thought it would be beyond the powers of your intelligence military people to have recovered something more by now. Can you shed any light on that? Well, I am open-minded on your first question. I think it's probable that it was, or at least the most likely explanation is that it's, they're originated from China, but I don't think it's impossible they originated, say, from Russia or even maybe North right. Korea, or even that they're potentially mm -hmm. private companies, platforms collecting things. I think we are taking a different attitude towards uh, unidentified flying objects that are entering our territorial airspace than we were even a month ago. Okay. On the second one, I mean, General Dunnett would know more than I, but, you know, this very demanding operations to recover th things underwater, I mean, we're having trouble or it's taking some time recovering the original balloon, which is in, off, the, off the Carolinas, which is balmy compared to Lake Huron, let alone the, the Arctic Ocean. Uh, Dr. Um, Liebling, can you um, give us your insight into what you think is going on here? Why now for a start? Well, it's not why now, it's now it's been understood. And what okay. we're seeing is America waking up to the fact that there's, in a way, been a Trojan horse campaign by, by the... Chi well, the Chinese have admitted that it's been their balloon. But that type of program that the Americans have announced tonight that the Chinese have been doing has been using what is a Trojan horse. It looks very simple, but the level of surveillance should be taken very seriously. And specifically, what do you think they are looking for? And is this just the beginning? Are they going to be... Are they over Europe as we speak? The, the way in which we should look at them is in associating with the new weapons. Now, what China and Russia and North Korea have in abundance is our new, our new forms of weapons which are highly manoeuvrable, super fast. By the time they, you see them, they've got you. Now, these balloons going over the missile sites in America may be helping the Chinese to practice a new form of entry targeting to destroy those missile okay, sites. OK, so hang on. You're saying that they are going where they've been brought down, that is proximate to missile or military sites or what, installations? Because I hadn't heard that before. What we were told with the the announced Chinese spy balloon, mm. announced by the Americans, denied mm. by the Chinese, is that uh, there were, was a movement over one of the major missile silo sites right. in now America. That, that makes sense. What about yes. the other ones? The, the other ones, I think we should look at... The, it's like space debris. Right. Until they have been found, everyone puts balloons up for various reasons. Oh. But the fact that there is a programme, the Americans now understand that America homeland, as we should understand as a nuclear nation here, will be being targeted 
and these close to the ground, highly capable surveillance balloons may not just be communications, but may be doing the potential targeting so, that a new uh, nuclear weapon may use in the future. You're, you're inferring that we should expect the same sort of spy balloons being over uh, the UK and Europe, I think. We may infer that if other countries have had them, but the main thing is to assume yes, and the answer is there's more close surveillance of potential sites than we may and have then, assumed. Let, let's bring uh, General Dannett back in, if I may. Um, can I ask you whether you think um, that it is likely that these uh, unidentified objects may be over European or even UK airspace, and if so, do we actually have the capability to down them in the way that the Americans have done? Um, I'm quite sure that that kind of surveillance is very widespread. But I think let's put it in the context of, yes, of course, China you can describe as a threat, but I would actually describe China as a very aggressive competitor. So it's trying to get information it can convert into intelligence that it can use to its own advantages. Now, your last speaker was saying... Of course, these could be conducting surveillance operations over um, nuclear uh, missile silos. But that's really why it's so important that the United States and the United Kingdom has got continuous at-sea underwater deterrence. We've got submarines. No one knows where those submarines are. You can fly as many balloons as you like over the United States, over the United Kingdom. But it, when our submarines are under the water, you don't know where they are. So uh, our nuclear-assured deterrence is very much in place. So I think we've got to see this in the broadest sense of the Chinese yeah. trying to compete with us for information, intelligence, for their own advantage. Indeed. So thank you very much, General Dana, and for our guest from Washington and also from Sally Levesey. Thanks for that. I mean, I find this all honestly quite scary. It, I it's mean, actually, we, it's, it's amongst the scariest things that we can sort of think of. Yeah, I mean, these um, UFOs, it seems odd to think that they've, it's happened so suddenly. And what I haven't, I don't feel I've completely got a grip on is the extent to which they've been floating around lots of these things yeah. and we're only just noticing them or is there a sudden escalation now? And I have to say, I'm pretty sceptical that we've got the ability uh, to both spot and deal with them in the way that the Americans have got. Yeah, I, just, I mean, it would be nice to think that we, we could leap like into the air so. and down mm. them, but yeah. Well, let's see. Doubts. OK, uh, coming up next, a language teacher takes her own life, tragically, ahead of allegedly assaulting a pupil, sparking outrage amongst her colleagues for a lack of support. We'll debate how the government stems the exodus of teachers from this noble profession. straight to the point. World-class broadcaster Vanessa Feltz is on Talk TV every night of the week. From politics to pop culture, there's no subject she shies away from. And remember, if you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Join Vanessa Feltz on Talk TV every day from 4 p.m. back and he's uncensored debating the breaking news and talking to the biggest names Piers Morgan is live every week with a host of stars uncompromising unmissable and uncensored and remember if you're thinking it we're talking about it Piers Morgan uncensored Monday to Thursday at 8 p.m. on talk TV
leading Britain's conversation. Oh, no. Uh, with the People's Channel. No, we're already used. Uh, every little helps. For God's sake, is nothing original anymore. It's finger-licking good. I'm loving it. Look, let's be honest. We don't have any fancy speechwriters here, but we do. And I promise you, discuss the issues that matter to you. Yes, I'm back. Talk TV, not with Morgan, just before him. Monday to Thursday at 7pm. Join me. Just do it. Well, that one too. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Thousands of schools across the UK are set to close again later this month in strike action over pay and staff shortages. Education unions say lack of staff is now a critical problem for almost every school. <laughs> A third of England's teachers who qualified in the last decade have left, and almost half of those remaining say they plan to quit. As well as falling real terms pay and exhaustion, teachers encounter an unprecedented level of abuse and lack of respect in the classroom. Take languages teacher Catherine Scowler. Now, this is a really disturbing case. She tragically took her own life ahead of a trial for allegedly assaulting a pupil while she was trying to take away the pupil's mobile phone. She was widely respected and well-liked, and it's thought that what happened was she caught the girl's hair while she was trying to confiscate the phone. Naturally, Catherine's family are absolutely devastated, and her colleagues right across the profession are rightly furious. Head teacher Catherine Burble Singh tweeted in response, the daily abuse teachers receive across the country is what unions should be shouting about, but they rarely complain about behavior and we all live in denial. Well, it is, uh, it's an awful case, isn't it's it? It's just unbelievable. Mm. And our next guest sadly lost his job as a teacher when he refused to affirm a pupil's gender change. Kevin Lister taught maths at a further education college, but was sacked for not referring to a 17-year-old pupil who was born biologically female, but then chose to become preferred a male and use he, him pronouns. So, is cancel culture piling even more pressure on the already strained profession? I mean, you might be wondering what, what is the link here um, between this awful case of the suicide um, in, I think it was in Scotland, um, and, you know, your case, which is clearly a very different set of circumstances. And I suppose what both things play into are the pressures on teachers in our classrooms, the extent to which they're supported, uh, and the extent to which, and I know this is something Catherine Burble Singh, who tweeted about the uh, suicide of that uh, poor lady, feels very strongly about the shift of power in our classroom from the traditional setup where, you know, the teacher was the person in charge here and widely respected, and hopefully parents backed up the teacher to a point where you as teachers are often feeling besieged and as if you're the one that has to continually justify uh, your attempts to bring discipline into a classroom. Yeah, yeah I mean, f firstly, I, I don't know the details of this case, but my first comment on this is my heart absolutely goes out to the family. It, this is an extraordinary, terrible, terrible situation. Um, you know, I thought what happened to me was bad. Yeah. What's happened to her is, you know, takes it, takes it on to... And you're to, right, and, and we you... don't actually know many details. And I think because she had been charged, that will have limited the reporting yeah. on this case. So papers wouldn't have been able to say much. I wonder and hope now uh, that it is possible for the full details to be brought out. Why mm. was the decision taken to prosecute her? Exactly what were the circumstances of her alleged yeah. crime? Because I think we need to know, uh, don't you... Uh, whether she received the right kind of support and what treatment was she yeah. on the receiving I, I, end? I think, I think probably the best thing I can do, the best comment I can make for her and for her family 
and maybe even also for the, for the students who were involved in this as well, is to compare it with the situation that I found myself right. in, which is what, you know, what, what you're looking for, obviously. And she sounded, from the, the small bit I read in the article, as a superb public servant. She'd been yeah. in the army, she moved into teaching. She sounded someone who wanted to do her best for society. Mm. Um, she's gone into teaching with the best of intent and she's ended up in this appalling situation. Yep. Situation that I was in was something similar. You know, I go into teaching because you know, I want to do, do something good for society. Mm. Now, I'm deeply concerned where society is going. Our young people face ter a terrible future now. The, you know, the discussion you've just had, climate change and so forth, is a bleak and, and awful situation. So I wanted, you know, I, you know, I go into teaching to try and encourage students to, to, yeah. to be able to equip themselves intellectually. Quickly, what happened to you? Yeah, so, so what basically happened to me is, you know, with that ethos of teaching, I then find I, I have a, a student in my class who decides to tell me by um, a text message, basically, that from now on, right. she is now going to be referred to as, an, as a male name. OK. Um, I raise it as a safeguarding concern. Fair enough. Uh, I, I say, uh, ask three questions. I say, do we have parental consent? Yeah. Is she making an informed decision? Yeah. Is there a risk that she will take cross-sex hormone treatment and self-medicate? Basically, you can buy all this yes. stuff yeah. easily online. Yeah. And then how does that... Um, manifest itself with the college's drug policy. Just, just to be clear, because I do think people will wonder this, did you have a problem per se with the pupil wanting to change their pronoun, or was your concern more for their welfare? It, it was entirely the, their welfare. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, what I expected is that the college would sit down with a safeguarding strategy, we'd have doctors, social care, parents and so forth, and we work out what's the best way forward. But what actually happened? So what actually happened was a college then said to me... They turned on you. Yeah, that um, they were not going to tell the parents. Within three days, they had encouraged her <coughs> to actually go about changing her name on the college system. So they were not going to tell the parents at all. They have this idea that they do not want to out any parent, any students, rather, right. to the parents. Is it a matter of record how old the pupil concerned was? The, pu the pupil was 17. Right. Yeah, so yeah. over 16, at least it's not a 13-year-old, but... No, but, uh, I mean, Ava, a 17-year-old uh, wanting to transition, should the parents be told or not? Well, I think it's important to understand the context of this. So you were given a very polite text message by this pupil who said this is how they would like to be referred to. You took that into your own hands. I think you are totally right to go and raise that as a welfare, as a safeguarding issue. I completely agree with you. You don't want any risk of, you know, people self-medicating. However, what was actually <laughs> your reasoning was not quite as valiant as you've laid it out here. You actually don't believe in it on a fundamental level yourself. You don't believe it in a moral level. And I feel like I can say that because on your own Twitter feed, there are homophobic comments. You have previously said that you don't believe that people, gay couples, should be allowed to adopt children. So for you, this is actually a moral issue. But you didn't and look, you, that. Kevin, Kevin, you might have to let Kevin respond okay, Kevin. to that because yeah. Ava yeah. has just accused it's, you of homophobic comments. Can yeah, you respond yeah, it, to that? That's not homophobic. If two guys want to have a, a he sexual relationship. He did say it, though. Yeah, he did say it. Did, yeah, but it's, it's not homophobic. But how is it? Can we just clarify what is it that you said? So, so the, Peter Butterberg was the, he's, he's currently running, or is one of the, the front runners, is the, uh, Democrat presidential candidate. Right. Him and his partner... Oh, Peter Buttigieg. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I pronounced it wrong. Uh, so him and his partner had arranged to have two babies delivered to them on the same day, and they posted that up on right. Twitter. That, to me, is um, basically child trafficking. Right. That, that's taking a child off a baby. Um, well, that, that is child trafficking. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think I'd be talking about Pete Buttigieg. I understand. Um, I, I get uh, your argument. I do think that kind of the way you're phrasing it is a bit far-fetched. I mean, we know kind of instances of child trafficking where people, are, kids are literally ripped from their parents. I think what they're doing is legal. You may not agree with gay adoption, which is fine. I, I completely understand that. But I do, I do think, you know, that there, there might be a language issue. I think back to the student, though, I think the, 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 the questions that you raised, I didn't see any hint of homophobia there. I think he was perfectly, he was perfectly um, reasonable in saying, what is this, you know, is there a risk of self-medication? What is that, how, how does that yeah, align I with the school's drug reasonable. policy? And, and I think that's perfectly fair enough. And I, I don't think his personal beliefs but, should have anything to do with that. There are the, many people in this country, for instance, who would agree with him. I don't think that has anything to do with the case of this individual student where, where was, asking to be... Where was the support from the college 
you raised the safeguarding issue yeah. and they've come at you instead. Yeah, no support from the college at all. So what the college basically did, and if I found this out subsequently with a subject access request to Swindon Borough Council, was no. they instigated an investigation okay. of me all right. but before they told me and then started a safeguarding I'm, accusation We should be careful me. not to go into too many details because also we haven't got the college here to give their mm, side sure. of the story. I and mean, I do find this really disturbing. As a parent of three fairly young children, yeah. you know, the idea that they might raise this in a classroom and the school would take a decision not to tell me, I find that really troubling. It just feels like there's a complete lack of support from the leadership in Kevin's school yeah. uh, and in Catherine Scowler's school. Um, it just feels there's a lack of support yeah, in the if union. We want, if we be... want good people to stay in the teaching profession and to enter it, they need to know that in a classroom they're in charge. And, that they, you know, and crucially, that parents back them up. Parents back them up, the unions back them up, and the leadership back them up. Well, next tonight, thank you very much indeed, thank Kevin. You. Uh, and we'll see the pack in a second. Uh, next night, we've got Michael Gove secretly meeting Labour MPs in a secret summit with discussions about Brexit's successes. Oh, no, failings. <laughs> Have the Tories not so secretly betrayed Brexit? All of that after the break. and always straight to the point. World-class broadcaster Vanessa Feltz is on Talk TV every night of the week. From politics to pop culture, there's no subject she shies away from. And remember... If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Join Vanessa Feltz on Talk TV every day from 4pm. back and he's uncensored debating the breaking news and talking to the biggest names Piers Morgan is live every week with a host of stars uncompromising unmissable and uncensored and remember if you're thinking it we're talking about it Piers Morgan uncensored Monday to Thursday at 8 p.m. on talk TV Britain's conversation. Oh no. Uh, with the People's Channel. No, it already is. Uh, every little helps. For God's sake, is nothing original anymore. It's finger licking good. I'm loving it. Look, let's be honest. We don't have any fancy speech writers here, but we do. And I promise you, discuss the issues that matter to you. Yes, I'm back. Talk TV, not with Morgan, just before him. Monday to Thursday at 7 pm. Join me. Just do it. Well, that one too. Well, coming up on The Talk, criminals are running riot. New figures suggest huge spikes in theft and two teenagers fatally stabbed in just 48 hours. The Prime Minister says Britain's ready to shoot down Chinese spy balloons and our gender-neutral awards fair. Harry Styles wins big at a male-dominated Brits, but it was women who had a clean sweep at separate theatre awards. That's all coming up at 9 o'clock.
Welcome back. Well, Ava and Esther are still here and we are going to Richard's favourite subject, which is Excellent. Brexit, because apparently there was a secret summit mm. at a place called Ditchley and this was full of, well, quite a lot of Ramonas, I would say, with a sprinkling of Brexiteers, <laughs> some really big names, Peter Mandelson, David Lammy. David Lammy. Uh, we had Ollie Robbins, who negotiated the terrible deal that Michael Boris signed Gove. up to. And Michael, Michael Gove. Gove. I mean, who knows where Michael Gove stands on this? I mean, we thought he was a Brexiteer. And now, who knows? It's hard. It really is hard to know. So I'm a bit annoyed about this whole Ditchley thing. Annoyed? I'm you, furious. I, yeah, but as you know, for another reason, Ditchley's just round the corner from, from my house. So we could have gone up there. You we were hoping have, for an invite. Uh, well, no, I wasn't. I think we could have sabotaged it. Ava, did, <laughs> Ava, did you get an invite? Have. I, I didn't. I didn't. And I'm an arch remainer, apparently, aren't I? <laughs> I know. I would have and been you're, right. and you're, yeah. a you're a Labour but, darling. But, yeah, but, but seriously, <laughs> I mean, uh, this is extraordinary. We've only been out of the transition period for two years. Mm. And the government have... Uh, that's a question That is fact. a very long time, though. No, it's not. That Jesus, is a very long oh, time. Oh, Ava, give, a, give me a break. Come on. Right, we've only there been out go. two years, during which time we've had a... A, a pandemic, but already, and a war. already, oh, nice. the forces of Ramon are conspiring oh my God. <laughs> to essentially betray Brexit. Everything that the country voted for, betray uh, all those who voted Leave, and and work out ways essentially how to slip us in through the back door, the side door, without anybody noticing. I mean, are, are you? Do you think this is the right thing for a sovereign state to do? I don't think that's what was going on at that meeting. Really? I think that was... A, I actually think that was probably more of a Labour getting prepared for government. I think that that is part of their entire well, plan. Peter Manderson being Michael there. Michael Gove doing that? Well, that, that is a question yeah. for, you know... You know can I, can I, but what's important yeah. about Brexit is that it's not working in its current form. Well, we can both agree from, on that, OK? It has no, we can't, actually. Sure. No, we, we can't. Can I can't agree that I can't it's not working. Well. It's a great platform of opportunity that this government have refused to use. You can't eat opportunity. You can't trust... An no, opportunity. But, but but equally, don't give it away. Keep that opportunity and use it. That's no what one's you taking do. it away. We've do got nothing think, left to do give. Do you actually think it's working now? No. Look, the point is, it's an opportunity oh. that can be a great Ava, success. I think you should. But this I, government I think, has utterly failed. I, 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 I would say, it's, say, well, I would it's say, a great opportunity that they're not using. Is that right? Well, the thing is, I think most people that even didn't even vote for Brexit recognize that th there is a lot of potential for the UK to grow, especially in the slump of the last decade or so. I do agree with that. However, there are very few people, I don't even think there's one person in this country that would say Brexit, as it is now, has been a resounding success. I will make the would point... Would you, Richard? No, that's not what I'm well, saying. Exactly. What I'm saying I think, I think it's a agree platform on that. Of, opp of opportunity Be that, that as this government has chosen not to use, and already people are trying to essentially... Uh, betray it through the back door without having given be, it a be proper that, chance. Be that as it may, I think we can all agree it hasn't been a resounding success. I will mention that yet. Michael Gove... I think the key thing is Well, yet. it could be, yes. So, I mean, we could be optimistic. So, right. so what potentially as many as 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit may feel is that there is an absolute plot here. I mean, let's look at what Nigel Farage tweeted. I don't know if you spotted this earlier, Richard. He was tweeting... Uh, that there is a, a plot, basically, make no mistake, to uh, sell out Brexit. The full sellout is underway. Now, Nigel, you and I both know Nigel well. You know, he's obviously prone to, to see a, a plot and a conspiracy, <laughs> quite understandably. He's been on the sharp end of plenty of those. Uh, but he does have a point, doesn't oh, he? Oh, completely. I mean, I think that's what it is. I think it's sort of preparing to, um, to essentially sort of... Um, completely lose that opportunity. I, I, think, I think that's an that's... unfair. I think that's unfair. And, I, and I, I, I'm aware, I'm familiar with Nigel's. Well. I think that's unfair. I think what that's a bit sensational. What do you think is going on? And I will say this: in my, in, um, Gove's defence, I think he's usually been. He's a very unpopular figure in Westminster. He was seen as the one who backs that Boris and all of that. But actually, if you look into sort of his his premonitions back in the day. He's actually been right on a lot of things. He could see the failings of, of Boris before Boris was even made prime minister. There are a lot of things that he has made a point uh, of that have actually happened. I think this is more didn't bipartisan. Him, I think this is more serving. bipartisan. I think this is more bipartisan common ground because no one can agree that Brexit has been a resounding success. Yes. It could be because that the Labour tried. Party... They have, they oh, I agree with you there, but they I don't think it's regulation. a massive... Cutting taxes. Are you out of your mind? Cutting taxes. That's we how you just, grow. We just had taxes We just had taxes cut. What, not even four months no, ago? No, no, absolutely. And what nonsense. happened to the economy? Well, like, they were actually cut. Mad. There no, was no, it's not about this because you've got to cut the mountain of wasteful government spending, say where you're going to save the money, and then you cut taxes for the least well off, the Cutting lowest government paid. spending is not going to recoup any of the GDP that we've lost due to Brexit and exiting the single market. It's uh, not going to happen. 
absolute nonsense. You've got to grow your way out of this crisis. You cut taxes, but that creates growth. But we can't grow because we're not no, linked to the single biggest trading bloc that's available more. to us you've in the entire had, world. Hey, you've just in, had in AstraZeneca. Defense, the EU is and, not the only trading bloc. Hang on, let's world. be clear. You've just had AstraZeneca, Largest. a British yes. company, announce they're, the they're making a manufacturing plant. They're building it in Ireland because we've in increased taxes here. You're going to put here. all of your you... chips into the AstraZeneca basket. No, That's I think we've I'm just going to say. say a lot of you've got there. right now, you've got Europe not willing to trade with us. You've got US not willing to trade with us. You do well, realise that our trade is increased. deal with Australia. You we are absolutely are. at a do loss you, here. Do you realise that our trade to the EU has increased since 2016 and since we and left how much are we now paying on that? How much are suppliers losing by, by having to charge for imports and exports? M small suppliers are going out of business every single day. And for what? To fulfil a dream of a few Brexiteers? To fulfil the opportunity of growing madness. faster and being a sovereign there nation is where no we control. Growth. Right, you two, There's no growth. There's no growth. No, <laughs> she's wrong <laughs> again. Break it up. Oh, my gosh, you've got him. Honestly, I'll never hear the end of it now. <laughs> uh, we want to talk about something like more light-hearted, which is the weird and wonderful outfits at the Brits. Now, I'm not sure that you were exactly glued to this. Of course. Like, I mean, I was, you know, um, probably got you, one of these outfits in my wardrobe. I really hope not. <laughs> That's <laughs> most, something I don't know about you. Uh, Sam Smith, come on, let's... What, very quickly, what uh, do you think he, of... He looked like a toilet plunger. Absurd um, outfit. But, you know, at least he was happy... Ava probably looking celebrated like that. it. No, it's a, it's a piece of art. I thought he actually looked fabulous. It got everyone speaking. Ma'am, do you know, do you you know what you made me really fabulous. sad, actually, was the amount of people on their armchairs at home tweeting about how much they I, hated it. Does anyone have anywhere to go? Think about Piers's tweet. I think we have to see Piers in this outfit. There we go. Uh, I'm very glad that you didn't mock us up in those. That would have been a sight for sore eyes, wouldn't it? Goodness me. I mean, um, so... Uh, you're sort of pro these uh, gender neutral awards. Is that the right way forward? That is such a huge question. <laughs> I mean, and you've got five you, seconds. You've got five Go seconds. for it. <laughs> <laughs> See how he did that? Yes or no? Yes or no? I think, I think that, yeah, it's sad that people can't acknowledge women unless they have to. OK, yes. that's a yes. Uh, I'm definitely not for these I gender think neutral that's awards. Quite Absolutely not. enough of but, that. Well, that's it from me. And that's it from me. Whatever you're up to, keep it uncensored. Good night. and always straight to the point. World-class broadcaster Vanessa Feltz is on Talk TV every night of the week. From politics to pop culture, there's no subject she shies away from. And remember... If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Join Vanessa Feltz on Talk TV every day from 4pm. back and he's uncensored debating the breaking news and talking to the biggest names Piers Morgan is live every week with a host of stars uncompromising unmissable and uncensored and remember if you're thinking it we're talking about